This is a this is a talk I've not given before here or anywhere else. Uh, so you'll you're my guinea pigs on this. You'll have to give me some feedback afterward and let me know what I need to change. But it's an area that I've I've obviously got a personal professional interest in. Uh, this is what I do. I do higher education, and I've watched a lot of things change over the years. I was informed by a colleague of mine at Wofford College, where I teach um, in South Carolina, that um, I'm now considered a senior faculty member. And I, I'm not sure how well I took that. I'm used to being the, the younger faculty member and, and uh, with all the, the privileges that go with that. And, uh, and so I, I've been around higher education for uh, about 25 years now and uh, went to graduate school here at Auburn and um, did my undergrad and my master's at Clemson. And now I teach at a small liberal arts college. So I've seen a, a variety of things. Um, I've seen private education, large private universities that I, I've, I've taught in a large private university. I've taught in a small private college. I went to school at large state institutions. And again, a lot of, a lot of stuff has changed here. I, maybe I should have said crises because I'm going to talk about three different crises here in this talk. I'm going to get through as much of this as I, as I can. Uh, the first crisis is I think that college does not do what it advertises. Maybe it hasn't for some time, but people seem to be recognizing this. So we might want to ask, what is it exactly that we expect higher education to do? Do we expect it to transfer skills to the students? I think that's the most common view of higher education. You go to college so that you can learn something, so that you come out with greater abilities in some area. You learn something about business, or you learn something about language, or you learn about uh, a science. You, you learn something while you're there, and then you come out better able to do whatever it is that you've set your sights on. But there's been some work done in recent years um, uh, looking at the uh, so-called signaling hypothesis, that is, that higher education is not so much transferring abilities to the students as it is performing a kind of a sorting function and uh, allowing those who pass a certain number of tests and other hurdles to demonstrate to the um, potential employers out there that they have a certain um, skill or characteristic about them that is desirable. Uh, maybe it's that you've got a disposition toward higher, higher order thinking and going through four years or more of higher education is a way to prove that. Um, uh, some invisible characteristic that you could only get through college and you would only stick through it for four years if you actually had that characteristic. But it's not that college actually confers that on you. It's that it, it, it uh, allows you to create a kind of a, a, a billboard that says, you know, I am X, whatever the characteristic is that you'd like to demonstrate. Another possibility is that college is simply a consumption good for higher income individuals. That it's just, if you've got enough resources available to you, then you get to go and, and uh, stay at a place for four years and partake in all the social activities. And maybe it's a kind of a chance to, to meet up with, with people um, that are similar to you in some character, in some way, and, and you, you can enjoy your four years on your parents' dime. Maybe it's your parents' dime, but uh, it's just something that is a consumption good. So uh, you'll see different takes on college. Um, you have probably seen something like this or heard about something like this, that if you go to college, your income will be higher after you graduate than it would have been if you had stayed with your high school diploma and, and uh, simply entered the workforce as a high school graduate. And so there is a correlation between higher education attainment and higher income. So on this 
uh, graph here. This is the probability of being in an educational group for a given income level. The data are a little bit old, but uh, I think that the point remains um, true. If you're in the $150,000 a year income level and up, there's about an 80% chance that you have a college degree. If not that, then you've, there's about a 10% or so chance that you've got uh, some college. Uh, whereas if you are in a lower income group, like let's say twenty dollars to $30,000 a year, there's only about a 15 to 17% chance that you have a four-year college degree. So there's a correlation, a pretty strong one it appears, between attaining a four-year degree or maybe more and, uh, and having a higher income. Uh, you'll also see data like this. This is uh, college, the return on college education compared to alternative investments. So uh, this is the internal rate of return here on the vertical axis, and you see about a 20% rate of return to a, an associate's degree, a two-year degree, about a 15% rate of return to a bachelor's degree, uh, and uh, that beats, it appears, uh, things like the stock market, AAA bonds, gold, long-term treasuries, and housing. So this is the kind of thing your parents tell you when they say you need to go to college, right? So uh, what are you going to do if you don't go to college? You're, you're not going to learn anything, and your income will be low. Well, again, there is a correlation here, but exactly what is, what is going on? Um, the signaling idea, I think, is worth some consideration. So let's, let's think about how this works, because the outcome of the signaling hypothesis may look very similar to the outcome of the college as conferring skills idea, the human capital um, uh, idea, because you end up with college graduates that have um, higher incomes in, in both cases, but maybe for very different reasons. So I don't know how effective this would be. I came up with this um, a few days ago as I was working on refining this, uh, this talk, and I thought, you know, a diagram is always nice. So here you have the population made up of reds and blues, and that's not Democrats and Republicans. That's, um, I've sort of divided the population into people who do not have some desirable characteristic in the workplace, like, like, let's say cognitive skills. Okay, cognitive skills, let's say. So the reds do not have those skills, and the blues do. Okay, and I, I put over here, uns, uh, motivated, persevering, intelligent. That's, that's kind of the characteristics we're looking for. You, you want, uh, employers uh, tend to want people who are motivated, persevering, and intelligent, let's suppose. All right, so there's the population made up of this... Uh, this mixture of people. So college serves as a kind of a filter. And uh, it's a filter for motivation, perseverance, and intelligence. And uh, if you pass, then you get into this box here with your sheepskin that says, I am a certified, motivated, persevering, and intelligent person. Okay? Then there are people that attend college, but they don't complete the program and they either they either fail or they drop out. I'll remind you Bill Gates was a college dropout so this is not necessarily a problem. It has a lot to do with opportunity costs but so uh, some people fail or drop out and they get dumped into this box which is people who are perhaps motivated, persevering, and intelligent but they're not certified as such. And there are people who uh, chose for one reason or another not to go through the filtering process, either because they didn't think that their chances of passing would, would be very great, or because they thought the cost was too high, or because they had some better opportunities than spending four years sitting at desks listening to people try to convert them to Marxism. So, um, <laughs> they, uh, so you have some blues that bypass the filter, but also some reds that bypass the filter, save themselves however many thousands of dollars, tens of th hundreds of thousands of dollars on, on education, and they wind up in the same box. So you have people with a signal, 
and people without a signal, and if you're an employer and you value perseverance, motivation, intelligence, then you might go shopping for employees among college graduates. This may explain why employers often require a college degree. Now that's changing, and we'll talk about that a little bit. This is the way that, that uh, higher education might function as an effective signal. But what's happened is that the government, especially since World War II, has become increasingly involved in higher education, partly through the GI Bill and later through more and more subsidies. And you can go back before World War II and you can find land-grant universities that were, that were uh, subsidized by government and, and other state institutions that, that, are, uh, that are beneficiaries of taxpayer dollars. So you, you can find this going back a long way uh, but it seems that in recent years, the level of subsidization of higher education has increased. So what's that done? That changes the situation a bit. So here you have your population, and you have now tax dollars extracted by force from the population, and they are turned into subsidies to distort the decision that a person makes between going to college or not going to college. And uh, so you now have more people going to this filter process. Notice the arrow is larger. Isn't that nice? So, uh, so then you have more people in, uh, going through this filter, uh, some of whom pass, some of whom fail as, as before, um, and then perhaps fewer people, people choosing to bypass the, the filter because if, if somebody else is paying your your costs, then your, your decisions might, might change. There are some scholars who've argued that this is, this is a wasteful process. I tend to agree. Uh, if you encourage people to go to college through either subsidizing the institution, which then starts shopping around for more students to justify the per-student subsidies they're receiving, or you subsidize the student directly, you're encouraging more students to go to school. So you're encouraging more people to try to um, uh, gain this, this signal, this, this billboard that says, I am motivated, intelligent, persevering, and so forth. Um, and you'll notice the way I've created this. In the first diagram, we have only blues that made it through the filter. Now you've got people who are motivated, persevering, intelligent, or at least certified as such. And you've also got people who are certified, motivating, intelligent, motivated, intelligent, persevering, who are not motivated, intelligent, or persevering. But they've got the degree anyway. Okay, there are a lot of universities that are uh, um, accepting students with lower and lower admissions requirements because the subsidies from the government are tied to the number of students they have. So their incentives are open the door wider, take students, collect their subsidies, certify them, even if they don't in fact have the characteristics that employers happen to have been use, uh, 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 happen to be looking for. Uh, Brian Kaplan, uh, has a recent book, I think it came out in January or February, um, arguing that this, this subsidization of higher education is socially wasteful. And he says, what we're doing is we're not just ranking people, we're ranking people and then we're encouraging them to go into more and more education, higher education, which is useless from the point of view of creating this, this signal. He says, since the status quo is supported by hundreds of billions of dollars of subsidies, we're probably underusing alternative certification methods like apprenticeships, testing, boot camps, and, and so on. So uh, there are other ways to certify yourself as having desirable um, employment characteristics. 
So he goes on to say that signaling explains why students are far more concerned about grades and actual learning. They want easy A's, not professors who teach lots of job skills. Signaling explains why cheating pays. A successful cheater profits by impersonating a good student. And signaling explains why students readily forget course material the day after the final exam. Once you've got the good signal on your transcript, you can usually safely forget whatever you learned. Uh, now, most of you probably are in an institution of higher education. I'm sure that's not true of you. You retain <laughs> everything that you've learned, right? So it doesn't, it, it has a very long half-life for you. All right. Kaplan goes on to say that we need far less education, meaning schooling. Okay, there are other ways to get education. Um, Murray Rothbard wrote a book back in the 1970s uh, called uh, Education Free and Compulsory, and I think he was mostly talking about secondary education, uh, primary and secondary education, not so much higher education, but he, he made this point that education is not just schooling. You can gain an education in other ways outside of formal processes. Anyway, Ka uh, Kaplan goes on to say that the cleanest way to, to get far less education is to sharply cut government education spending. Employers will no longer expect you to have the education you can no longer afford. In other words, spending cuts will cause credential deflation. You'll once again be able to get low and middle skill jobs with a high school degree or less. There's no point in having a four-year college degree if you're, in, if you're going to be working at a coffee place. Um, and we, we actually have a lot of people with four-year degrees who are working in skill, uh, working in jobs that have no call for the skills that are allegedly obtained in that four-year period. There's, you've just wasted four years and racked up some student loans for what? Um, there's no point. Uh, so Kaplan says, there's little sign that education causes much enlightenment or civic understanding. This is in response to the argument that, well, you know, maybe this is not just for the workplace. Maybe this is because college allows people to be more enlightened individuals and they become better citizens, whatever that means. And they, they become more knowledgeable about how to interact with each other. And, and so they become, um, you know, better people. Um, but he says, even at top schools, most students are intellectually and culturally apathetic and most professors are uninspiring. I recommend that you take a look at this article published about a year ago by Jonathan Newman. Is Jonathan here? There he is. Uh, great, great piece on Mises Wire uh, about why college degrees are becoming useless. Um, he says in that piece that graduates are displaying little to no improvement in critical thinking skills. He says that some of the most prestigious flagship universities' test results indicate the average graduate shows little or no improvement in critical thinking over four years. Employers are beginning to discount this degree signal as well. Google doesn't care if potential hires have a college degree, they look past academic credentials for other characteristics that predict job performance. For example, they had a billboard, I think in maybe San Francisco or something, that had a quantitative kind of problem on it, a mathematical problem. And they said, if you can solve this, call us, essentially. And so they're, they're filtering, but they're not doing it through a college or university. And... Uh, uh, so that, that, that may become more widespread. We may see uh, employers looking past your credentials, recognizing that these credentials don't mean as much as they used to. There's also a substantial amount of um, grade inflation. Uh, Marcella Bombardieri, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, says that at Yale, 62% of grades are in the A range. Uh, Arthur Levine found in a national survey that 41% of students had grade point averages of A- minus or higher in 2009 compared to just 7% in 1969. Everybody gets an A. So what does an A mean anymore? What does graduating with honors, magna cum laude, or, uh, summa cum laude, or what, what does that mean anymore if you're, if you're um, 
if you have these honors, you and everybody else, so what? It's not a signal as much. So there's another argument that education, higher education, maybe apart from whatever it does to allow you better opportunities in the workforce, um, there are some that say, well, it, it, it lowers, uh, that's mainly for humor. Um, it, <laughs> there's some that say it's, uh, it's, it'll reduce crime uh, because people who are college graduates don't commit crimes as much as people who um, are not college graduates. Randall Holcomb says, um, th this is wrongheaded. It, he says, this is uh, inefficient. People who are not going to turn into criminals anyway are enticed into gaining a higher education um, certification when they, they wouldn't have turned into criminals had they just kept their high school diploma and gone into the workforce with just that. So he says a more efficient policy would target criminal activity by punishing the criminal activity uh, rather than trying to get people to um, have a college degree on the on the idea that this is going to increase their incomes uh, and, and make them uh, not become uh, criminals. So there was a study, uh, there have been a number of studies on this, obviously, but um, Andrew Norton from Australia uh, looked at this recently and he said, you know, graduates are likely, college graduates are likely to have quite low conviction rates. Uh, he says in 2009, only 14% of 25 to 34-year-old prisoners had completed year 12, compared to 63% of the general population. But he says it seems more plausible that graduates are people who are always at relatively low risk of offending, regardless of whether, the, whether or not they pursued higher education. This low risk would be a function of better socialization and the ability to earn a reasonable income without breaking the law. Education is likely to have whatever preventive effects it is going to have well before higher education. You heard that of that book, Whatever I Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten? <laughs> well, maybe not quite kindergarten, but uh, a lot of what you need for um, becoming a productive person is, uh, is gained well before higher education. Uh, my grandfather on my mother's side, quit school after eighth grade. That was not as uncommon in his generation as it may be now, but uh, he did he did fine. You know, he uh, did, he was a very productive person, very hard worker, and uh, he did very well for himself with just his eighth grade education. That was, for what he needed to do, that was sufficient. Uh, uh, Norton goes on to say that if you look at uh, the connections, in Australia at least, between education and crime, you see this. Okay, so up until about 2001, if you were trying to make the argument that more higher education means uh, less crime, uh, you'd have a, 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 a bit of a problem because we see... The, the blue here is crimes per 100,000 people, and then the uh, kind of purplish line here is the higher education attainment rate. So uh, we, we see the, the correlation going in both directions. There's a positive correlation and a negative correlation. So um, it, it, there are some other factors involved in crime rates. You can't just point to higher education and say, well, you know, all we need to do is get people more, better educated and then we'll solve our problem. So he says a third factor at least partly explains both trends. He says the collapsing labor market opportunities for men with little ed education over the past 30 or 40 years made both crime and higher education more profitable relative to the alternative of welfare and insecure jobs. So crime and higher education both increased. It's not, it's not as simple as just throwing dollars at higher education and expecting crime to, to decline. He says there's no direct relationship between crime and higher education. If you increase higher education, you're not going to get a reduction in crime. A second crisis is that government subsidies are backfiring. And tuition is increasing. Future earnings are decreasing. This is, again, from Jonathan Newman's um, 
piece on Mises.org. According to Doug French, um, college tuition and fees have increased 1,120% since records began in 1978, and the rate of increase in college costs have been, has been four times faster than the increase in the CPI. You can see that here. The red is public four-year institutions. The blue is the consumer price index. We're seeing a huge increase in tuition relative to uh, prices in general. And if you look at this, uh, this is the ratio of average tuition and required fees for all four-year degree granting institutions relative to median household income from 1969 to 2012. And in 1969, up until the early 1980s, tuition and fees was about 8 or 9% of your median household income. And uh, then we got a steady increase so that in 2012, it was consuming over a quarter of the median household's income. Uh, so it's become less and less affordable. And we can see this also if we look at the delinquencies on student loans. So these are student loans, or not just student loans, but all kinds of loans. They're balances that are three months or more delinquent. In 2004, uh, going through about uh, first quarter of last year, and uh, you can see the you know credit cards are this dark blue line here, kind of a, an increase here due to the last recession and then a decrease as we had some economic recovery. Uh, the student loans are this, this darker red line here, and we can see that uh, they've become a real problem, especially uh, after about 2012. Uh, the delinquencies on student loan balances ha have increased, and these are particularly problematic for the borrowers because you cannot discharge these debts with bankruptcy unlike some other kinds of, of debt. The people who are most adversely affected by these are people who went to college for a while and then they quit before they finished. So they don't have their degree, so they don't have that signal. Doesn't matter if you went to 3.9 years of college and then left. Your employer's not going to assume that you have you know, almost all of your education, and they're not going to treat that the same way they do somebody that actually finished, okay? That doesn't show that perseverance that they are looking for. Now, this graph, is this 10% of, this is saying 10% of student loans are delinquent after 90 days? Is that all student loans that are held across the United States right now? Uh, yes, it, actually a little more than 10%, yeah. maybe 11 or 12, but yeah, that's... That's, all student loan debt. Uh, that's my understanding, yeah. yes. Uh, this is from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. We can investigate, see if maybe there's some more recent numbers on this for the last year. But, but yeah, I mean, so if you quit uh, partway through your education, you still got to pay those loans back, but you don't have the higher income necessary to make that more possible for you. Uh, William Bennett in 1987 said that increases in financial aid have enabled colleges and universities to raise their tuitions. So this has become known as the Bennett Hypothesis. And there have been some studies, fairly recent studies, um, looking at whether or not this is true. Now, I don't have a lot of time left, so I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. If you are interested in the details of the studies, I can talk with you afterward and maybe send you my slides or something. You can get these, these uh, papers. So there's a 2007 study here um, looking at the response of university tuition to federal grants and aid, like the Pell Grants. Uh, this one says, uh, little evidence of the Bennett hypothesis for in-state tuition for public universities, but for private universities, a nearly one-for-one -one relationship between increases in Pell Grants and increases in tuition. And out-of-state tuition seems to behave this, uh, in a way similar to in-state tuition. Nicholas Turner, 2012, um, intended cost reductions of tax-based federal student aid are substantially offset by institutional price increases 
for a sample of four-year colleges and universities. Tax-based aid crowds out institutional aid roughly dollar for dollar. In other words, the out-of-pocket cost for students is not improving simply because the government is throwing more money into higher education. And we'll talk about where the money is going in a minute. Um, Cellini and Golden, 2013, does federal student aid raise tuition? New evidence on for-profit colleges. Uh, basically, the answer is yes, about 78% higher tuition in places that are eligible to participate in federal student aid programs. 2017, Luca, Nadal, and Shin passed through effective tuition on changes of student loan maximums about 60 cents on the dollar, smaller but positive effects for unsubsidized federal loans. Gordon and Hedlund, 2017, accounting for the rise in college tuition. This is a chapter in an NBER book saying basically the demand side shocks, which are subsidized student loan availability, caused tuition to jump by 91%. All other changes except those we see increases in tuition by only about 14%. So he basically is saying, look, that the main thing that's driving tuition up is that we're getting subsidized student loan availability. There are other things that might drive up tuition, but um, that seems to be a very important one. Now, where is that money going? Okay, well, if you walked around the campus over here, you probably saw some of the construction uh, there's been construction at uh, my college and most colleges and universities. You'll see this kind of thing. Perhaps some of you have seen that. How many of you who are in college right now have seen construction on your campus in the last year? Okay. All right. So uh, dormitories, campus amenities, administration buildings, administration salaries, Princeton, we've got somebody from Princeton here. Is that student here in the room? There we go. $136 million in a student dorm with leaded glass windows and a cavernous oak dining hall. You live in that dorm? No. no? It's really nice. You see that? <laughs> it should be $300,000 per bed. Per bed. I expect a butler if I'm going to stay in that building. <laughs> Uh, since 2000, uh, NYU has provided $90 million in loans, many of them zero interest and forgivable, to administrators and faculty. Why? To buy houses and summer on, homes on Fire Island and the Hamptons. Very nice. Ohio State President uh, Gordon Gee earned nearly $2 million in compensation last year, living in a nearly 10,000-square-foot Tudor mansion on a 1.3-acre estate. $673,000, my house would be $673, in art decor and a $532 shower curtain in a guest bathroom, uh, private jet, uh, all the rest. Um, the University of California employs about 2,400 people just in its president's office. And Richard Vetter says... Um, now we, we have 30% of the adult population with college degrees, and according to the Department of Labor, only 20% of so or so of jobs require college degrees. We have 115,500 janitors in the United States with bachelor's degrees or more. Now, why are we encouraging more people to go to college under these circumstances? He says, basically, you know, in the housing market, we, uh, through the Federal Reserve, created these lower interest rates so that people could go out and buy houses, and now we're creating uh, similar incentives for people to go to school, and why do we expect different results? Let me talk a little bit about for-profit education. Um, this is not new. Some people act like it is. It's not. Uh, in 1897, which was not the first time we saw um, for-profit education on the scene, uh, more than 92% of college, uh, college students were enrolled at for-profit institutions. Um, some of these were good. Some of those were bad. Um, same kind of situation, I, I think, today, except that today there's been this gusher of federal money made available 
to for-profit schools, and they, like the banks during the housing bubble, have acted in, uh, in accord with the incentives created for them. So, in 2016, while 15% of for-profit student borrowers on a federal loan have defaulted since 2013, 7% of students at private schools and 11.3% of borrowers at public universities defaulted in the same time period. For-profit education giants, and some of them are truly large or were large. Some of them, like University of Phoenix, have shriveled up and, and I don't know if University of Phoenix, I, it is still around. I saw an ad for them recently, so they're still around, but... Um, a ghost of its former self, as I understand. So, uh, so what what happened? I mean, they 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 grew fat on a steady diet of government credit by cleverly maneuvering their way through a vast field of regulatory landmines to take advantage of federal aid programs aimed at helping those they ultimately hurt, students. So, um. Here is the percentage defaulting on student loans within three years is the dark green bar there, 21% for for-profit institutions compared to, uh, say, 16% um, for nonprofit two years and 6% for nonprofit four years. Now, many people have looked at this and they've said, oh, well, obviously the problem is they're for profit. See what happens when the market gets involved in higher education? Uh, evil profit-seeking people. I mean, <laughs> what? Uh, so they say, well, you know, that's that's the problem. So um, A.G. Smith and another Mises.org article that you can take a look at, I encourage you to, um, said, uh, as expected, many have ignorantly aimed their weaponry at the profit motive instead of unleashing their fury on the root cause government interference in the market. So we've, we do see that for-profit institutions seem to have generated more graduates that have trouble repaying their student loans, or maybe just former students who have, who have um, not been able to repay their, their, their student loans as quickly. Part of the uh, reason for this is that they're reaching a different kind of student, typically. Uh, they're reaching people who are often part-time uh, because they've got a lot of other things going on in their life. They've got um, employment, full-time employment. They've got families. They've got maybe health problems. They've got a lot of things going on. And those things by themselves are going to compromise their ability to pay any kind of debt, uh, but maybe especially student loan debt. Um, and so we, if, if you get students that are already kind of financially compromised coming in the door, why would we be surprised to see them financially compromised once they uh, leave the institution? And yet what's happening is we're, we're blaming the institution itself rather than uh, looking at the student loan availability that is encouraging them to take that route in the first place. So um, you, know, you look back at the housing market crisis, and uh, I talked to students today who weren't really thinking about finance when the housing market bubble occurred. They're uh, they were, you know, eight years old or something when it happened, and uh, yet their their impression of it is, well, the banks just got greedy, and that's why we had the housing market crisis. And I say, look, I, greed is probably not the best explanation of this. I point them to Tom Wood's book, Meltdown, and some other resources, and I say, look, it's, it's the banks are responding to. Not that the banks are not without, not that they are without guilt, but they are responding to incentives created by the Federal Reserve, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and all the other kind of interventions that the government had provided to shove people or at least induce people to take out loans uh, who were not good credit risks. I think the same thing has happened here, and the for profit institutions have. Um, have more than the other kinds of colleges and universities 
received those applications from those credit compromised in individuals. Um, so uh, Smith says, a market has natural mechanisms for punishing credit abusers. Unfortunately, much to the dismay of the American taxpayer, such mechanisms are not intrinsic in federal financial aid, where everyone enjoys equal status regardless of their ability to satisfy debt-related obligations. It doesn't matter, I mean, what your previous um, situation is or what your degree choice is or anything else that might indicate something about your future ability to repay. Uh, federal financial aid is, is intentionally blind to that kind of thing, and it ends up creating some real problems. I'm going to skip over some of this since I only have a couple of minutes left. you like that. <laughs> Let me just uh, move on to my third crisis very, very quickly. Some of you have seen this stuff already. Uh, colleges and universities turning into... Um, uh, shouting matches and so forth, uh, students occupying um, um, administrative buildings and making demands that certain people not speak on campus. Um, so there's a lot of this. Uh, you, uh, if you haven't heard about this, then um, feel free to talk with me afterward. I'll fill you in on some of the examples of this, this sort of thing. But uh, So... A 2017 study of college students said some students say shouting down speakers and using violence is sometimes acceptable. Not a majority, but it doesn't take a majority to really create a problem. 90% um, students of college students say it is never acceptable to use violence to prevent some from speaking, but 10% say it is sometimes acceptable. Wow. 37% uh, believe it is sometimes acceptable to shout down speakers. This is disturbing. It, it, it's, uh, now, I, again, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to cut to the chase here and um, skip through some of this stuff here. Uh, yeah, Murray Rothbard in Ethics of Liberty, one of his uh, more influential works, I think, uh, said, let's look at this human right of free speech. Freedom of speech is supposed to mean the right of everyone to say whatever he likes, but the neglected question is, where? Where does a man have this right? He certainly does not have it on property on which he is trespassing. In short, he has this right only either on his own property or on the property of someone who has agreed to allow him on the premises. In fact, then, there is no such thing as a separate right to free speech. There is only a man's property right, the right to do as he wills with his own or to make voluntary agreements with other property owners. In short, a person does not have a right to freedom of speech. What he does have is the right to hire a hall and address the people who enter the premises. He does not have a right to freedom of the press. What he does have is the right to write or publish a pamphlet and to sell that pamphlet to those who are willing to buy it or give it away to those who are willing to accept it. Thus, what he has in each of these cases is property rights. There is no extra right of free speech or free press beyond the property rights that a person may have in any given case. So um, what about this fire in a crowded theater? You know, I have the right to free speech that allows me to shout fire in a crowded theater. No, because the theater owner did not grant me that right to falsely, I should qualify, shout fire in a, in a crowded theater. It's the theater owner's theater, and the theater owner is there to project a movie, and all the other people have the right to enjoy that movie because that's what they paid for. So if I go to an event and there's some controversial speaker and I want to hear what the speaker has to say, People who come in and shout down the speaker are violating my property right, which I obtained by gift or purchase from the owner of the venue. That's the real problem with some of these things. And uh, I'll leave you with that since I'm out of time. Thank you very much. <laughs>